Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bone. The Bristol Blenheim is one of those aircraft that, for most of us in the AV geek world, we do give a bit of a kicking to. It did not have the greatest entry into service, and those months in early 1940 during the Battle of France, it had a hard time. But the aircraft does have its fans. And I'm joined by one of them today, friend of the show, James Jeffries, who you might remember from our episode on the historiography to go with Len Dighton's bomber. He joined us with Dan Elin to discuss that. Now, one of James's many faults is he likes the Blenheim. Really? So I thought we'd get him on. And for this episode, we're going to keep it a bit freeform and just basically ask him why. Let's have a counter argument to the general malaise that the Blenheim gets because he makes a pretty good argument. So we're not going to get into too much of the technicalities. We're not going to be doing the technical aspects of the aircraft, but we're going to be looking at what it did, talk about the crews and the different way the aircraft was used. And of course, what the aircraft was developed into. So we kind of have to start by asking James the obvious question, which is why? My dear James, why does someone who purports and sometimes comes across as intelligent, why are you so enamored with the Bristol Blenheim? Something that yeah, probably is one notch up on, on the defiant for AV geek, AV geek kickery. What, what is it about the Blenheim for you that makes you fight these hills that the rest of us just go, oh, mate? <laughs> I mean, if I'm going to be perfectly honest, the Blenheim is fairly shit. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> and that's the pod. Thank you for joining <laughs> us. Thank that's you. Good night, everybody. <laughs> no, and um, the, the thing that really got me was, I mean, I was like a lot of other people, absolutely ca captivated with the Spitfire, the Hurricane, all of the sort of aircraft that you jump to, and certainly uh, I was known as Spitfire Jeffries at school. Believe it or not. Um, sure. but when it, <laughs> but when it came to the Blenheim, it, it really developed, I say about 2015, when I was doing my, uh, master's dissertation, I got the inspiration to look at Bomber Command and Coastal Command in the Battle of Britain, because I felt that the way that the Battle of Britain is remembered as a Spitfire summer, which is the phrase I absolutely get, oh, when I tear my hair out. Over. You're um, not alone. You're not alone. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I just found out, you know, I, I can't remember. I think it was James Holland's book. I was reading about the um, a, a two group Lenin squadrons that were raiding Luftwaffe airfields. And I'm going, wait, this isn't the Battle of Britain that we're usually talking about. You know, the RAF on the offensive, raiding airfields. I, I knew about the Battle of the Barges. I knew about the raid on Berlin, obviously, because I'd watched the Battle of Britain film. Mm -hmm. um, and it really led from there. And when I was reading about two group, I was, obviously they were at that point, of, you know, mainly Blenheims. And I got the admiration, really, it was the crews first, because they were the part of Bomber Command that was, we, we, so, so rewinding slightly, We've got this idea that Bomber Command, as soon as things didn't work out by December 1939, everything was at night. You know, daylight raids didn't happen. But two group, when it came to the Bristol Berlin, they still raided by day. Same goes with the AASF in the Battle of France and such like. Um, so I was immediately drawn to that and went, oh, this is a little bit different. And when they raided Luftwaffe airfields, it was by day. Granted, it, need, it needed to be seven-tenths cloud and set conditions and such like. But I was finding that these crews went, you know what, our country's about to be invaded. Um, that is another separate debate. Um, let's raid these airfields. This needs to be done. So they would often go against, um, in, you know, the, the, the pre-required rules and such like, the you know, the orders to raid these airfields. And I was all of a sudden, why are we not talking about this? This is a key part of the Battle of Britain. And I was reading uh, accounts by Luftwaffe personnel going, this is a nuisance. And especially considering how small Bomber Command was at that point, I think it was about 500, 600 aircraft at most. Probably. How, how small the RAF was in total. 
Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, to have this effect and to be, you know, having this campaign was like a thousand sorties. And I was looking at um, some of the aerial maps of the bomb damage. Yeah. I'd say most of it was fairly um, what you would expect of that stage of war, but some were hitting and it was still annoying. And you have these accounts by Luftwaffe personnel going, they're keeping us up, they're keeping us up, up at night. You know, how are we supposed to have command over the skies of England if these light bombers are coming over and doing what they're doing? And all of a sudden, my mind went, I need to think differently about two group. I need to think differently about the Battle of Britain. Um, and it was a very, very enlightening. And that's where the admiration for the Blenheim came from. It was more to do with the crews. Um, and I mean, you have some absolutely horrendous raids that happen. But I think when it comes to the Blenheim, we're used to this idea of May 1940, uh, you know, the opening days of the German offensive, where they are shot out of the air. And this is the thing that I, I want to say is, when the Luftwaffe are unescorted, they're at low level, they're shot out of the air as well. So why are we pinpointing this on the Blenheim cruise? It's not me saying the Blenheim is suddenly an amazing aircraft. It's me saying, hang on a minute, it's not completely awful, which sounds really rubbish, actually, as a, as a defence. But, I mean, hats off to the crews that knew this as well, you know. And kept doing it day after day. Two, two group doing, is yeah. just fantastic because yeah. their whole and it story... led to second tactical air force as well yeah you know the, the lessons that were learned and the other thing we forget is we, we, we think about um you know europe and such like second tactical air force yeah it came out of two group learning these mistakes uh <laughs> you know the circus raids and such like the rhubarb raids and and, and, and such like um you know yeah they, they, they they are horrendous, but there are the, uh, the, the the Blenheims used at Dunkirk. And actually, I, I think um, we need to focus more on what is learned in the desert, in which case Blenheims are involved, mm -hmm. as are other aircraft. And I think just our focus is a little bit slightly wrong, which has a detrimental effect, uh, a, a detrimental influence, should I say, on the Blenheims, but also the crews of the Blenheims as well. So the point, I suppose, that you're trying manfully to make is we're looking at a very <laughs> small sliver of the Blenheim story, aren't we? We're, we're looking Absolutely, at a, yeah. a point in time that's less than ideal. But just for the, the listeners who have not had the misfortune of meeting a Blenheim, um, <laughs> <laughs> what was it? Because it, it came from somewhere a bit odd, wasn't it? Because it wasn't mm. intended originally as a bomber. No. And then, yeah, the Daily Mail got involved. So it was Lord Rothermere um, that put in a lot of uh, money towards this, who we won't question his, uh, well, we will question um, mm. <laughs> his leanings politically um, towards the Nazis. And such like. uh, but um, yeah, this is the, the idea is this is a privately funded project. And I think the Blenheim, um, some nerd will correct me. I know some were some nerd will correct me but i believe it's 80 miles an hour quicker than the latest raf fighter when the blenheim first takes to the air so the raf are immediately ring, going ring, hang on a, a bell minute. 80 yeah yeah so the raf immediately going hang on a minute we should really be doing something with this <laughs> um this is only a few years before the war so it's immediately thinking okay this is a fighter this is also a bomber and again this is a little bit of an unfair thing is just how fast aircraft de development happens i mean we're not even talking in that period but we're talking about i don't know over 30 years someone said to me once that the first man on the moon uh compared to the wright brothers flight is well, how many years is it was it 1969 1903 it, that is within a life span you yeah. could be you could be sitting watching both you know, that, that's a very broad outlook towards the development of, of, of flight. But you think about the development in the 1920s, 30s, I mean, even the 40s, we go from biplanes to jet engines, you know, and, and, and the Blenheim's left behind. But the Blenheim, when it first comes in, is absolutely leading the way. You can see why the RAF jumps on it. And I think you can see the foundations there for the need of an aircraft like the Mosquito, 
you know, they're looking at a, a twin engine bomber that can that can be multipurpose. That's the basic. The Blenheim was attempted to be multipurpose. It was a fighter as well as a bomber, reconnaissance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, I, I, I think the RAF are leaning in a certain direction. It's just not quite. <laughs> it's just not quite the Mosquito. But the intention is there. Definitely. And it comes from Bristol. And they're... Yeah, they're a they're a funny outfit because they're doing everything, aren't they? They've got they're sort of one of these multi multi talented um, outfits. They're looking at strapping their own engines on it as well, and yeah. it's it's a complete in house job. Which, given where yeah, it's sort of a bit of a left turn off the the Blenheim cul de sac, and you do end up at the the bow fighter, which is extraordinary, mm. don't you? Oh, it's incredible. also from Bristol. Um, by by way of the bowling book and the both four as well, yeah, all, all these different little variants that that, that mm. spawn from it. So it's it's fast, it's nimble, it's not big though, is it? Because I've had the interesting, dubious pleasure of sticking my head in um, John Remain's one when I was mooching around his mm. hangar many years ago, and then got told off. Um, <laughs> but it's I just from my getting into the pilot's hatch under the nose of the the sort of reconstituted one they have, which is, it's a, mm. it a bowling book with a, yeah, it is. Yeah. It's, a, it's got the, the, short, the shortened nose on it. Yeah. Well, the shortened nose yeah. was actually a electronic car, which is why it's got a, a tax disc at the front. <laughs> so, so there's an ex worker of, of Bristol that somehow got hold of, you know, the, the front part of a Blenheim. I decided to turn it into an electric car. Uh, that is now what is the front of, the Blenheim that you see now, but it is, it is supposed to be a long nose, you know, Mark IV, yeah. Berlin Brock, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. It, it, in my youth, pr prior to your days, of course, but that's ages ago. <laughs> I remember seeing, I seeing it flying around with the, the, the Mark IV, the Berlin Brook version with the mm. long nose, but, yeah. but it's not big because I couldn't get, no. I'd have to twist funny just to get my shoulders in because it's, um, getting into it is not big. It's not, a, it is not a big aircraft. So no. when you're thinking they're classing it as a medium bomber, um, and at this point, Wellington's heavy, isn't it? That's yeah. sort of the the uh, the mindset at which the RAF is starting to do their classifications. Yeah, yeah. and I, I, as you as you well say, that changes over the course of, uh, of the war. There are no four engined bombers mm. uh, for bomber command at the start of the war. This is the evolution. So when this is something that I, I definitely reach when I I get into talks and I say, "Oh, heavy bombers in 1940." Oh, wait a minute, hold on. That's a medium bomber by 1942-43. You know, it actually emphasizes just how far the technology develops. And the Blenheim, yeah, that, that is a that is a light bomber. It's it, it's with the battle, which I um, also have an interest in. <laughs> I won't defend quite as much. Um, see, when, when when I was when I was online, um, <laughs> but the interesting thing is because I've. Mike Bechtold's written uh, mm. quite a bit about uh, Raymond Collishaw and Bardia and his use of the birth of tac the modern birth of, of tactical air power, and that's where we see the Blenheim come into it when it's being Absolutely. used as a coordinated weapon. That it wasn't being done in France, and again, it was being used as a in essentially the same sort of role that the, the B twenty five would be deployed in a couple of years later in the Middle East. Yeah, you know, we'll we'll touch on Greece a bit, but especially in that sort of winter of forty, um, in those those first counterattacks against the Italians, it's used in the right way, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And and this is the thing that I kind of want to highlight is when it comes to the Bristol Blenheim, <laughs> the collective popular memory I don't know what you want to phrase it as is of May nineteen forty. Or is of I don't know the the you know 1941 these absolutely stupid raids over France and the Low Countries. It's beyond that, and it is as you say out of Britain as well. Uh, it, it's used in the Far East. It's used in the Western Desert. We need to talk about this. We need to highlight this. I think that, and I, I think we do generally when it comes to the war as well. Actually. Um, but it's but the millennium seems to fall down this. I can't think of any other word other than hole um, where you know, it, it's just lumped together. It's like oh, it's useless. But I would say that 
when it comes to RAF bomber command and actually bombers in general, there is this narrative of like, yeah, they were useless before Harris came in early 42, um, which is a general memory, which I absolutely refute because there's so much to be learned then. There's so much to be developed then. I think that, you know, you look at the Battle of the Barges, you look at certain events, you, even like when people say, oh, the, you know, the uh, nickel raids were, were used. Oh, sorry, nickel raids were when they were dropping uh, leaflets over Germany saying, we think it's a bad idea you're going to war. They were learning navigational techniques. They, they you know, they, they were learning facts like, well, we can't fly at this time and we need to develop um, XYZ on the aircraft. I think they're important for, for, for that point of view. And they're still doing it even up until the end of the war. They're still dropping leaflets, saying things. You know, it's not like it was just that one period for six months at the start of the war. It's like, oh, what do we do with these bombers? Well, we fly them over and drop bits of paper saying, um, yeah, you shouldn't be at war with us. I think I, I think that's ridiculous. There are lots of things to take from this. Because nothing's done in a vacuum, is it? Absolutely, yeah. And... You know, your point there about it all clicking with Harris. Well, Harris arrives just as all the stuff that's been being worked on for yeah. the past four years starts c coming to fruition. And absolutely. The, the investment and the technology starts coming in. Yeah, it, it, it's absolutely huge. And it's based on the Butt Report. Um, it, what was it, August 41, I think? Mm -hmm. um, I think so, yeah. M mid middle of 41, definitely. Mid middle of 41, which isn't without fault. You know, there, there are things to be asked about it. Now, I realise it points towards a general direction, um, but it's, for instance, the faults are, you know, it's taken when the industrial haze of the Ruhr, you know, has, has an effect on navigation and, and, and targeting and such like. The same photograph taken by bombers is often used twice to count, you know, as different bombers and, and such like. There are questions. I'm not saying that it isn't, you know, driving towards a certain direction, Bomber Command was failing at that point. I mean, you can see what was happening on the ground uh, to prove that. It, 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 was the, it was the rocket that was needed. It may Absolutely, not have been yeah. the right rocket, but it was the rocket that they had. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. But that's the thing that I don't like is that, um, you know, before Harris came in, Bomber Command were useless. No, there were lots of lessons to be learned. I'm not saying they're perfect, but we need to learn about this. And actually, we need to highlight some things that did work. And I mean, you look at the Butt Report. Actually, raids on ports were mu had much more of a higher success rate than those in the industrial area of the Ruhr. And often, the stats that are selected and picks and shown, you know, are very selective. And they go, "Oh, look at the Ruhr. They didn't." But yeah, yeah. But look at what it did at these ports. And actually, you could bring in a counter argument of maybe we could use bomber commands. It's more of a naval support or whatever. I don't know. It's, it's, it's just like, you know, it's as ever with history, it's far more nuanced than is, you know, often the popular case. Let's jump back to the Battle of Britain because you, you've mentioned Sorry, the Battle of Britain. We're, 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 we're keeping this free form. We can talk about what we want. Um, <laughs> but the Battle of the Barges I, is, mm -hmm. is something I know that you've, you've yep. chatted about in the past. And it's, it is one of those ones that is usually a paragraph in a lot of books about the Battle of Britain, but it has a massive psychological effect, doesn't it? It's it's effective. Yeah. They hit their target, and it's more than one, isn't it? It's yeah. they're they're going in. They know that they're coming, and the Blenheim plays a huge part in yeah. attacking what are literally just bulk bulk barges that are going to be pushed up onto a beach it's it's yeah it's it's not it's not 1940 or the pacific ladies and gentlemen it's yeah, long long boats that'll be dragged across the <laughs> the channel and hopefully people will jump out the other side of them but mm. the blenheim does a great job in sinking them absolutely i think that when it comes to the battle of the barges it's Kind of brushed aside because of the, the the overall narrative of the Battle of Britain, which is, oh, it was over the skies of England, and that was it. And you can go, oh, yeah, sea line wasn't serious, and it wasn't. That's a separate argument. Regardless of what's happening, you know, 1940, you see these barges uh, building up on the channel ports, you're going to bomb them. 
<laughs> you know, the enemy's going, okay, they're assembling something. I don't, I, you know, that's a discussion for 50 years time, whether this is serious or not. We're seeing them over the water. We're going to bomb them. Um, and it's, it's roughly about 10% that are destroyed. And the Blenheim plays an important role, as do Hamden's and Whitley's and all the rest of it. And actually, a lot of squadrons, especially the Blenheim squadrons, attack twice in one night. And it's called the Blackpool Front because of the lights, the burning and, and everything that's going on. And, you know, two Victoria Crosses are one on these raids. It, it, it It's pretty serious. You you have a uh, Roderick Leroy. So you've got the raid on the Dortmund Ems Canal, which is supplying uh, barges through Germany towards Channel Boards. I don't know, it's a top of Holland and it goes around. Um, See your World War II show for, for that one. Uh, uh, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate the plug there. Not that I'd make any money out of it. But... <laughs> <laughs> um, keep, and you've also, really <laughs> you also got John Hanna, um, a sergeant who wins a Victoria Cross. He's 18 years old and he bats away a. a with his logbook, the, the the flaming Hamden that he's in, and anyway, that that's by the by. Please look it up, guys. Um, you know, this is taken seriously, and the Blenheims are involved with this, and they're key to this. That you know, they're 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 the fastest uh, twin engine aircraft that are available to do this. Um, and I really, I, I count it as part of the Battle of Britain, and actually, the nation did. You look at the uh, Roll of Honor for the uh, Battle of Britain cruise that was written in 1943. It's in Westminster Abbey. It's still there, folks. Read through it. It's got Bomber Command and Coastal Command listed. They are part of the Battle of Britain. Um, and that includes the Benning cruise. And yeah, it's it's it, it's so, so important. It really, really is. Why? Let's change the conversation slightly then. We've joked about its reputation and things like that, but why do we have this reputation of it? Because none of, if we look at look at the arsenal, you've mentioned the Hamptons and the Whitneys and things. Mm. In in that great pantheon of Second World War aircraft, they all fall into that early stuff that was used for things that they weren't particularly designed for. Why mm. do we give the Blenheim such a hard time when, oh. It's a Hampton, isn't it sweet? Oh, it's a Whitley. Look at it. It's a bit, it looks a bit funny. Yeah, it, it's, we tend to give those ones a bit of a pass, but mm. the Blenheim, we tend to, we tend to, I tend to, um, put, put the, put the boots to. Why is that? Is that because it gets shot down at the beginning of Piece of Cake? <laughs> you, I, that, that's the thing is, when it comes to the popular memory of, the Blenheim, you have the the back them up posters where you've got the raid on uh, Fortuna, Cologne, 41. I can't remember when it is. Um, it, it, it's, it's a prevalent image. And actually, I think the Blenheim, one thing I really like about it, um, it's just how modern it looks, especially when it comes about in the 1930s. It just, there's something almost slightly Art Deco about it. It just looks slightly out of what's going on with the RAF. I think we have a very selective memory when it comes to the air war. Um, and <laughs> dare I mention the Spitfire um, and, and the memory you, of... You get charged a fiver every time you mention Spitfire. <laughs> <in the show. laughs> well, the best fighter aircraft of the Battle of Britain was the Hurricane. <laughs> A hundred percent. I am not and, joking, folks. Yeah, um, and, you, and you get the fiver back for that one. <laughs> but I think there is this, you know, the, the, the Blenheim, I think the RAF were keen to show it off in the late 30s into the 1940s. You see Pathé News segments, you, you see it on, on, on posters, you... you it, and you, you can absolutely see it, it was the... It, I, say, I said earlier, it was 80 miles an hour faster than the latest RAF fighter. It's a cool aircraft um, for a period. <laughs> it, it isn't so much afterwards. Um, but it, it, yeah, it, I think that's why it grabs that reputation. And when it comes to the failed raids in 1941, it is the Blenheim that's involved and it's seen as the, as, as, as the failure. It, it, it just kind of 
captures onto all of these things. And, and again, as we said earlier, we think of um, Northwest Europe and forget about when it was actually very useful elsewhere. I'm not saying it was completely useless in Europe, but um, I, I think that's one of the things that, that, that comes out of it. And suddenly you've got the mosquito that comes around. But I think it is a stepping stone towards the mosquito and, and similar aircraft. You mentioned the Beaufort earlier, uh, Bowfighter. That is out of the Blenheim realizing, OK, we need to channel this. We need to work on this, develop it for specific needs. Far too much is asked of the Blenheim um in my opinion for what it can do we're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the pima air and space museum with head of collections andrew bowley here we are again at the pima air and space museum um, we are inside one of our exhibits that we call the bing so you might ask what is the bing so during operation enduring freedom the early first couple years of a10 operations in afghanistan one of the first units uh, built uh, one of those temporary structures that were all over the place. I think they're called bee huts, if I recall correctly. And they turned it into what they called the Bing, which was kind of like a lounge slash clubby area for the A-10 pilots. Why was it called the Bing? Well, it was named after the strip club and the Sopranos. That's why it was called the Bing, because that was when the Sopranos was going, going on and was really popular. The interesting thing is the first unit was very specific that they wanted no televisions, no, or, you know, video games, computers, anything. It was a place to kind of, you know, have some drinks, relax, play some music. They left a code of honor saying no televisions, no video games, etc. with a photo of the cast of The Sopranos, you know, just threaten them. So what did the next squadron do? Well, they put in a television and started playing video games. So that's what's kind of interesting about the Bing is kind of this interestingly organic kind of thing that happens during the war that just kind of becomes different things and expands as it goes on. So, it, you know, it was in multiple iterations because A-10s were, you know, in Bagram, Kandahar. So they would take all the stuff off the walls, move it down to their next designation and put everything up. Um, a lot of the stuff is just random stuff off the Bing. It's a lot like a college dorm room you know you have your you know velvet elvis artwork um that looks straight out of a night you know 90s college classroom the the plaques that you see along the walls with the squadron deployments and everything those were actually not in the bing they were in their ops shack but they brought all those back so again you know stealing signs putting them up on the walls um, every time an A-10 pilot did a deployment to Afghanistan, they left one of their name tags or patches on the wall. So if you did more than one, then you left more than one. So some people you'll see multiple ones. Uh, you see some exchange pilots from um, foreign air forces that were flying A-10s. Um, I have to say this was a really fun exhibit to work on because it's a little different than the typical um, you know, uniforms, flight gear. And talking with the A-10 guys, they were really, really good about sharing information and being kind of open about things, you know? Like the bars had places to hide alcohol because technically they weren't supposed to bring alcohol into Afghanistan. So, you know, they would put, have alcohol sent to them in Listerine bottles and stuff like that and then hide them in here. Another interesting thing is um, they had a pink flamingo that whenever they were doing stuff like, well, drinking or doing whatever they don't want their CEO to know about, they would put a pink flamingo outside the Bing just to let the commanding officer know that now would not be a good time to enter the Bing. But it's in, the guys who, uh, the guys that we worked with on this exhibit were really good and really interesting. And uh, I had a lot of fun doing this exhibit, or we all had a lot of fun doing this exhibit. To learn more about what is on display and what events are coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, please do check out their website at www.pimaair.org. And now, back to the show. And I think the other thing we need to make clear as well is mention that it takes time to change. Absolutely. You know, you know, the hurricanes in production until 1944, the Blenheim is in production until 1943. You know, these are aircraft that they can build by this point. Yeah. 
a lot of them quickly. And that's where you get into this thing, which, you know, for, for all of the um, debate around the, the five types order in, in, in May 1940, the reason it's those yeah. five is they're in production. The tooling is there. They can iterate on that. It's not trying to squeeze in a, a tornado or a, a, a typhoon in and whatever the problems will be next year, we'll deal with that next year because mm -hmm. we'll be here next mm -hmm. year. Um, and that that's that's the thing. The, the decisions made five years earlier lead to the point where these are the tools we have. We have to make the best of them. And yeah, you know, I've just brought up the font of all knowledge, Wikipedia, mainly because I was trying to remember <laughs> the, whether or not they were in Singapore. They were in Singapore as well, weren't they? They were, yeah. And because um, it was Malaya where Scarf was as well. Um, it was, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's, yeah, they're, they're used and they are useful everywhere. Yeah. And that's not something you can say about a lot of other types that people yeah. well, brains. Even the mosquito, in. you know, in the far east, it's found wanting because the wood expands and there are all they sorts changed of. changed the blue, didn't they? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, it acts as a, and I'm a massive fan of the mosquito. And if anybody pins me down and thrashes me, I will say it is the best aircraft of the second world war. I, um, I, I, I may be on record on another podcast saying exactly <laughs> the same thing. Just because of the adaptability and, oh, yeah. you know, the multi-role purpose of it, I think is incredible. But when it comes to the mosquito and, and you raise an absolutely brilliant point, where it comes to the tools and mechanisms of it, you need to absolutely turn things around to mass manufacture something before it's been proven. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that that's a factor that comes into the blending. You know, it, it's fast, it's useful. I'm not saying it's the best bomber, light bomber mm -hmm. of the Second World War, but it fills a purpose for X amount of years. Um, and which is not something, you know, I get this argument of, why didn't the RAF just build mosquitoes from 1943 onwards? And it's like, well, they built a lot of mosquitoes. <laughs> um, but, you know, strategic bombing was the way forward. And for a period, it suggested that that was the way to go. Um, you know, you, you, there's a there's a heavy card of hindsight playing with it, that the mosquito, you know, uh, it, it, it takes time. It takes being proven. And also, you know, you, you look at the mosquito, it's you're training a lot of pilots and navigators, which mm -hmm. you're not necessarily doing when it comes to the Lancaster. You know, there are more crews to, to, to train, et cetera. But yeah, anyway, so, so I digress. I digress. It's, it's a decent digression to do because if, if you, I'm just sort of think, thinking about this for a second, Let, let's look at some of the contemporaries of, of the, the Blenheim. You've got yeah. um, flying fortress, obviously that comes along. Um, that thumb, thumbs down from, from James there. <laughs> dear listener um you've got the fantastically ridiculous uh douglas b18 bolo um mm -hmm. which looks like somebody made it out of lego um but only had like the 90 degree curvy bit um which is which is there but you know this is the sort of things that are coming at the same time the the a20 havoc as well yeah. is there just looking at say what's coming out of america at the same time so th there's there's quite a bit that is that same sort of period that's very much similar to the design direction that Bristol takes, especially when we start talking about what the Japanese mm. are doing as well. There's a lot that are very yeah, similar absolutely. to, to the Blenheim gone that have gone for two engined, reasonably lightweight, reasonable bomb load, but then speed. So it's, yeah, it's not something Bristol have done in isolation. It's not something that the RAF have done in isolation. Um, you just have some outliers in there, like, like what Boeing's doing, but Boeing are desperately trying to find a niche. That's a podcast for completely time. Agree. Yeah. I, you see, you've, you've got me now that I'm sitting here considering it thinking, Oh, maybe we shouldn't be that hard on it, but we, we, we shall. Um, that, that's the thing. That's the thing. I'm not, I'm not, professing or whatever the word is that it's the best bomber in the world but i don't think it deserves as harsh the represent uh, the uh, reputation that it gets it you know it, and it was useful you know there was a period of, of learning and developing and actually when it was used in the right sense it was pretty useful 
and it gauged the direction towards what was needed, whether that is the Mosquito, whether that's the Beaufort, whether that's, you know, the bow fighter, whatever. I mean, you've got the first nighttime kill by uh, a Blenheim with guided radar. Surely that is an indication of, okay, we need to work on this. We need to develop this. Let's get the bow fighter or whatever. You know, I, I, this is what I'm saying. I'm not saying it's the best, the most brilliant aircraft, but don't dismiss it. You know, <laughs> and especially not the cruise. Um, yeah. No, let, let's, because the, the story to the cruise are quite there. Now we can, it's, you know, you think, let's see. So Embry was shot down in a battle, wasn't he? So that's not what we're going to talk about here, mm-hmm. but mm. the list of people that f- I'm going to pick your brain here. Who would we know that were, were Blenheim drivers or Blenheim crew for that matter? Not necessarily just. Um, w- when it comes to the, the, the Blenheim, I think probably the most popular, most well remembered thing is dropping a leg to Douglas Barder. Mm-hmm. Operation Leg. It was a Blenheim that dropped it, folks. And, you know, dropped it fairly accurately. When it comes to <laughs> personnel, wow, it's, yeah. We're not looking at Cheshire or Gibson or, you know, uh, Learoyd or whoever, Nettleton. Um, yeah, it's, it does hit a brick wall when I think of popular. Is it the point then that maybe some of the more famous or the, the, the ones that became popularized during the time were flying different aircraft types? Is that maybe why the Blenheim comes yeah. up? Are, are we saying that potentially this is a PR problem? Because you don't yeah. have a Gibson, you, you don't have a Cheshire, <laughs> you don't have all the guys that you just mentioned. Yeah, probably. I mean, you look at um, Gibson, he was flying in Hamden's beforehand. You look at Cheshire, he was in a Whitley squadron beforehand. In fact, his book, Bomber Pilot, is a really, really good book, folks. I suggest you read it. Um, but you could, you could flip it around and go, why don't we talk about Hamden's and Whitley's? Because these famous people were on them. We have this memory of Bomber Command where it is Lancasters and it is Dan Busters. And sorry, that's that's the, that's, that's the key word, folks. Take a drink. Um, <laughs> where it is Dan Busters, where it is um, Tall Boys and, and such like, which is something that I... I don't want to say I ignore, but I want to highlight the rest of the bombing war, which is why I'm probably going on about the Blenheim as much as I am is yeah there's this whole narrative that explains what happens afterwards and the blenheim is a massive part of that you want to learn about the development of second tactical air force which people go on about quite rightly you know you need to talk about blenheims you need to talk about battles you need to talk about what happened you know two three years at the beginning at the beginning of the war as far as i'm concerned anyway that that's my job Matt, you, you talk about your typhoons and such like, please do. It's brilliant. Um, but I, I'm there going, hey, before that, there was this, you know. I tell a lie. Baza and Brie was 107 Squadron Blenheims. Oh, wow. So there we go. I was saying battles. I was giving too much, too much pride of place to that other airplane <laughs> that we won't, we won't talk about. But yeah, I, I was sitting here thinking that doesn't sound right. No, no, he, he was. He, granted, he was, he was shot down in a Blenheim. Um, but yeah, but he was he was a Blenheim man. Yeah. So there we go. We should be making more of a fuss of him and maybe the Blenheim. Let's let's just start. We we we've sort of Absolutely. been touching. <laughs> <laughs> I the, the good point I think there is what comes later. The use of aircraft like this, you know, it's it it was designed as a strategic mm. bomber. It it, it never would fulfill that role for, for many reasons. But your point about second tactical air force is right. Yeah. The developments in the desert air force from Collishaw through to Mary Conningham and, 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 and the like sees that type of yeah, absolutely yeah. low level, high speed attack being, being pushed forward by the time of mm-hmm. two TAF, there's none left in the great scheme of things. And you've got Havoc and Boston's and, and Mitchell's in, in that sort of role. But then you do have, fighter bombers that are carrying nearly the same amount of tonnage 
by that point when you start hitting 1944 when the Blenheim's yeah. out of production so i think that's that is a valid point to start seeing yeah. that that line being drawn for maybe a little bit further back if we were to say to the dear listener one thing that they should maybe go away and consider where should somebody look because i've looked there's not a hell of a lot of blenheim reading material out there I would say straight away, six weeks, Blenheim Summer. Um, I can't think it's Alice, Alistair something, I can't remember, is a fantastic book. And actually, if you're looking at the Royal Air Force in France as a general thing, um, from an NCO point of view, it's mm-hmm. very, very interesting. They talk about putting uh, being put up in, in billets and such like. Uh, you've got the Bristol Blenheim book, oh, which, oh God, the name escapes me. Um, it's not even on one of the top yeah, shelves, gonna, dear listener. He's scanning he's, those. He's... Well, it's it's there somewhere, but the <laughs> curtains are drawn, and I haven't got my glasses. That's my excuse. Um, yeah, you've got Chris Sams as well, where he writes about um, the early part of the war. I think that's a good introduction. Flying into the storm is a good book. We'll it, it's Sam's a good there. introductory book. Uh, yeah, uh, so. you've got Blenheim Boy as uh, was it Blenheim Boy? Yeah. Which which is uh, Richard Passmore. That's a very very interesting book. Um, and again, that kind of the, the, the six weeks of Blenheim summer ends quite quickly, and most of it. Oh God, I'm going to give the plot away here. Um, <laughs> ends quite quickly. That's all I'm going to say. But it's a very very good book. Uh, Blending Boy is a little bit longer, and I think it kind of goes into a little bit more detail about the experience of being on a Blending aircraft. When I when I've come across archives, one thing that I found actually was um, looking at the Imperial War Museum uh, interviews, which is a, a great source of of, of, of material. Something that really struck with me while I was doing my um, MA. So I was looking up two group. I was looking up Blenheims. I mean, I was looking up three group and all the rest of it. I was looking at the whole of Bomber Command, Coastal Command. Um, was this guy who name escapes me. I do apologize. Who got quite emotional during the interview about halfway through, as many veterans do during interviews. Saying, I wish the... Battle of Britain Memorial flight was a Blenheim. It should be a Blenheim. That would represent Bomber Command's Battle of Britain more than the Lancaster. And, you know, I mean, that, that wouldn't have been possible. And I get the fact that it's a Lancaster and Lancaster is Bomber Command's war. But hearing this veteran uh, just absolutely, you know, say all these things was incredibly moving. And I think that says a lot about the Bristol Blenheim. And when you look at the material from 1940 into 1941, it, it, it just seems like the the poster aircraft of taking the war to Germany, along with probably the Wellington. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, you know, Fortu- as I mentioned earlier, the Fortuna raid, it's on a uh, back them up poster. There's a selection for the fact that this bomber is going to represent taking the war to Germany. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's probably had a, a detrimental effect in the long term. But yeah, yeah, I, I think the name of the flight is something that's always been a little bit contentious when you, you look at the aircraft that that are in it. It's um, not necessarily specifically Absolutely, Battle of Britain, yeah. but just because there's Spitfires and, and Hurricanes in it, it's that's where everybody's thought thought process goes. There's yeah. If we were just to look at the font of all knowledge of the Wikipedia page, there's lots more to cover that we haven't. There's Finland, because the, the Finns used it. Greece. The Russians. There's oh, Greece as well. Do Finns like Greece, love the Blenheim. They absolutely love the Bristol Blenheim as well. It's in service until like the mid-1950s or something. Crazy. Which e- e- even me as a Bristol Blenheim fan would go, hang on, folks. <laughs> Hold on a second. Mid-1950s, there are better aircraft out there. Um, yeah, and I, 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 and you've got this bonkers situation. It happens, I think it's in R- Romania, um, where you've got 109s escorting Blenheims on raids. I, 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 you know, it's just like, and also the Finns, they put um, uh, 
skis onto the blenheims and all this sort of stuff and it's just like you guys are like the, the other aircraft are out there it's like no no we're fine we'll just readapt the blenheim to uh you know, it's just like, <laughs> as much as i love it folks but uh yeah they, they seem quite obsessed I think that's a pretty good place to leave it. Talking about obsessed Finns, they, they, the Finns must have been drunk when they were making some of those decisions. It's the only way to do it. They, 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 it is their want. I, I think we've done a good job. Of- so I haven't converted you. you. You've got, you've got to be drunk to to appreciate the Blenheim. Could be worse. <laughs> no, I, I think. <laughs> I think there's a there's a there's a lot there's a lot to take away and I think there's a lot to digest. And it's I think your argument, which I yeah, you know, I will in our lovely group chat with with Matt and, and Adam, I will still mock you when you bring it up because well we gotta. But there's <laughs> there's more to the sto- there's more to the story of the aircraft than I think we do get, give it credit for. And that one yeah. month in nineteen forty is not something that should probably be painting the aircraft maybe we should have you and phil Absolutely. blood on and we can we can Absolutely. we can really have this out <laughs> <laughs> i'm not sure i'm ready for that <laughs> where can people find you james if they'd want to learn more about this remarkable airplane <laughs> if you if you want to find a complete nut that the yeah you know. uh so i'm at james j history on most um social media outlets Super. We'll we'll put we'll put the links to you in the description, and we'll also stick uh, your World War Two TV chat um, with Woody in there as well, so people can learn about the the Dortmund's Elm Canal the first time round. Absolutely. So, thank you very much, mate. Thank you. I'm not completely convinced, but I think James did very very well. And what it's left me with the need to do, and I hope it's done the same for you as well, dear listener, is to go away and have a look at some of that reading material. Six Weeks of Blenheim Summer, Blenheim Boy, Basil Embry's book, Wing Victory, which is about written about him as opposed to that, and his own uh, book, Mission Accomplished. Probably worth going to check. Now, as I sit here and record this, I'm looking around, we've got pictures on the wall, but behind me up here, I have a painting of Cat's Eye Cunningham in a Bristol bow fighter shooting down a Heinkel at night. No Blenheim, no Beauforts, no bow fighter. Nothing happens in isolation. And I think that's an interesting point. The Blenheim may not have lived up to what it was hoped to do, but maybe it's not as bad as the kicking that we give. Something to think about. Next week, we are joined by Adam Berry, the final member of the AV Geeks group chat to join us. Matt Willis has been on far too much. And hey, look, his pictures are back there. So, you know, enough of Matt. But Adam is fantastic. And back in hedgehopping days, We were joined by Seb Davey of the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight, and we looked at the realities of what happened on the night that the 82nd and the 101st were dropped into Normandy. What happens when you're flying a C-47 and you hit a cloud bank? Go back and listen to that. It's very interesting indeed. Next week, we're going to look at what the 9th Troop Carrier Command did next. So resupply into Normandy, medical evacuation. We're going to look at... Operation Dragoon, we're going to look at Operation Repulse, we're going to skip over Market Garden, and we're going to leave Plunder Varsity for another time, because that's far too big to squeeze in. So that's all next week. Again, thank you so much for your support of the show. Like, subscribe, share this with your friends, put some stars into your podcast app of choice if you're listening to this on the pod. And if you fancy it, there is the Patreon. That's just £3 a month you get yeah, a thank you card from me that's all handwritten. You get stickers too. Check those out if you're watching the video with your own damn Castile one as well. And they look great. So if you fancy that, you get these episodes early, different intro and outro, and opportunities to ask questions to our upcoming guests as well. So like I said, £3 a month. Check out the links in the description. Regardless of that, thank you for your support. It means the world to me. The reviews that you've popped through and the comments that we get on the social medias is incredibly generous. So thank you. We're going to keep cracking on with this. Lots of fun to continue. As always, need to thank our partners at the Pima Air and Space Museum. More coming from them as we have renewed our partnership for the foreseeable future, which is fantastic. We'll be heading out there in the new year again. Thank you so much. 
Until next time, please do take care of yourselves. Bye-bye. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.